Randy has asked me to do something today that I'm not sure. Man, I've spoken on the resurrection a lot of times, like over 2,000 times. But I don't think I've ever been asked to do this. He said, let's go cool on the evidence. You know, you do the evidence every time you come here. Let the people hear your testimony and how you work through doubt. So I assume, you know, in this day and age, all Christians work through doubt at some time. Doubt may be the most common single issue Christians have. You know why? You can't have more than 100%. And everybody asks questions at some time. They lose somebody or an emergency, and you say, why didn't God come to my, my you know, help? Read the book of Psalms. I mean, David, in, in one or two Psalms, changes from praising to, but why did you do this to me? <laughs> in the same Psalm, believers ask tough questions. So he asked me to share with you today my testimony, which is going to involve the resurrection, but it doesn't involve evidence. Let me start. How often time do you hear somebody do this? I'm going to start by reading the conclusion only at the beginning, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says these words. He's quoting the Old Testament, and he says, death is swallowed up in victory. Talk about the resurrection. Because of the resurrection, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? He said, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then this verse of application. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Three things there. Be steadfast. That's move away from the doubt and be committed. And then he says, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, you're not saved by good works. But even Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says you're saved unto good works. So he says to good works. And the third point, he just got done saved. And if you read commentaries, this is really, really cool. Paul is not doing poetry when he says... Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? Paul's not doing this. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, he's not, okay. I'm German, that's one strike against me. I'm a, I teach philosophy, that's two strikes against me. I'm, you may be into poetry and that's wonderful, but I'm not. And, but this isn't poetry. Read the commentaries like Tom Wright and others. Paul is trash-talking the devil. He's saying, you've got nothing on us because you've got what you have, and we have the resurrected Lord. You don't even compare to us. Now, that's how I'm going to start. And let me move on to my, how this all began. My Christian life, first of all, I grew up in a very strong Christian home. We went to a German Baptist church. Um, That's where Randy and I both went and Warren. And my parents were outstanding believers. My dad was a special forces fighter in World War II. Now you have to understand the, the irony of this. We're German. He quit high school when he was 17 to join special forces and go to Germany to fight in the fatherland. And he would tell us, Germans are not Nazis, like Russians are not communists. There's differences, and yes, I'm going to fight, but I'm not going to fight our people. I'm going to fight the losers who took over the government. And he went, just before they got married. And so we grew up, I could tell you stories about things my dad did and what he would do and how tough he had been. He was only 17 years old. And that's my dad, very committed Christian. My dad was the college professor all my life, and he's the work. Well, my mother was too. She had six kids, so 
she was a workaholic, you have to be in the house, but my dad was a workaholic, never saw him not working. And so I learned that strong work ethic from my dad. We'd say my mom was the castle builder in our house. She was the, your home is your castle person. And my dad would beat anybody's head who wanted to come and say otherwise about one of his boys. There were five boys and we have a sister, but at that time she wasn't born. She's, she's the second from last. All the boys but one are pastors today. Pastors are Christian professors. And my only sister married a guy with a PhD in Bible. So we come from that kind of a family. My dad's a professor. And you say, well, golly, if that's the way your parents were, you must have had a strong Christian life. Well, I did. And I'm very proud of my upbringing. But two things happened. At the beginning of my life, and it's a while away now, but I went into a period of, I thought it was pretty severe doubt. And it lasted for all of 10 years and partially for 10 more years. So 20, harder the first 10 and less hard the second 10. But here's what happened. In 1958, the most important person in my life died. It wasn't my parents, they knew this very well. The closest person in my life was my great grandmother very godly woman, and whenever we go over to my grandparents' house, because she was my grandmother's mother, she lived with my grandparents. I lived with them later for three years while I went to William Tyndale College as a student. And while the other boys went out and played, I spent all the time with my great-grandmother. She's the closest person in my life. And in 1958, she died. I was too young to know what that meant. My parents, they think they made a mistake, but that's irrelevant, didn't bother me. They didn't take me to the funeral, but I knew she was dead. And that night I was so confused because she was up in the room dying of kidney failure and they wouldn't allow me to come in her room. But you have to understand I was always in her room and they wouldn't let me come in the room that night. They said, go downstairs and play in the rec room. And I was all confused and she died and after her death, I had become a Christian a year later, and right after that time, I started doubting my faith. You go, well, you're only 10 years old. Well, <laughs> figure it out the way you want, but I started, I started doubting my faith. And when I was 13 years old, I was full bore into my doubt, and she said, that's too young. Whatever. Talk to people who've done this. Craig Keener went through this when he was 16 years old. So it happens to people. But I started studying evidences when I was 13. Forget my age. I'm just telling, giving you chronology. But my, but my family said to me, well, here's some evidences for you. And in our church, we didn't do evidences. My, dad, my, my pastor, his first name was Adolf. We were German Baptist church. And he didn't really like evidences. He was a great communicator, great in the original languages, but he was a communicator on biblical truth and didn't care much about evidences. So I'm going into evidences. And he asked me a few times, why don't you put your evidences books away? Why don't you just relax and do this stuff? And I'd say, I can't. I am working through these problems. So my family would say, well, you know, there's some evidences for creation. You know, and intelligent design. Um, they didn't call it that then, but there's some evidence of creation. I took a quick look and I studied it and I thought, now I'm 14 now and I'm going, yeah, I mean, it is good evidence, but it's not gonna, you can't hang Christianity on intelligent design. Christianity, intelligent design says God exists, but it doesn't say Christianity is true. I mean, I was really saying that. And so I let that go. Well, look at archeology, span look at all the things they've discovered. That's wonderful. I looked at some arch that says some things are true that the Bible says, so it makes the Bible kind of reliable, but it doesn't make Christianity true. Oh, okay, how about this? How about that? And they gave me several things to check, what we would call the general field of apologetics today, and I didn't like any of them, because I wanted to know that Christianity was true, that these verses I read, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and John, death was swallowed up in victory in Paul, quoting the Old Testament, and I didn't think those evidences made 
much sense. And one day I was reading in a book, I was reading incessantly. I was not a good high school student because I did not care what grades I got in school. I came home, instead of doing my homework, I asked where I left off on my doubts. Now, two things ran my life in those days, sports and studying. Sports, hockey, and football. Uh, this is just an aside, but when I first went to Liberty, I was the head ice hockey coach for nine years, and we've been ranked in the nation every year. We just placed in nationals just a week ago. Our women's team were national champs five years in a row, Liberty University. And um, so sport, hockey, football. I would come in, a lot of you, if you're older, you know the rules. You come in when the street lights go on, and I wouldn't get my school work out. I said, where did I leave off on my doubts? And I'm studying all my doubts, and I started to get deeper into some of my, yeah, nobody's answering my questions. I wonder if this stuff's true. My pastor didn't do apologetics, great preacher, didn't do apologetics, and I didn't have much pe many people to guide me. And there were almost no apologetics books in those days. Very few. The ones that were out, I found them, but there weren't many. You could put them in a the stack about that big. And so I thought, I'm on my own. And to show you that, you're 13 years old, you can't be doing this. When I was 14, I wanted to make sure I was getting some of my doubts down. See, and I'd read a sentence in a book, and the sentence went like this. It wasn't doing apologetics either. It was a commentary, but it had this sentence. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, that alone can bear all the weight of the truth of Christianity. I said to the group yesterday at George Johnson's church at Hope, I said, if the resurrection of Christ is true, Christianity is true. You have to remember that because someone can say, well, as we got a question from the crowd yesterday, how old's creation? Is it young earth or old earth? One of our questions yesterday. And I'm saying, we're going, hey, look, we could try to solve any of these things, but if you want to know Christianity is true, you only have one question to answer. Well, it's the gospel. Did Jesus claim to be the Son of God, and did he back it up by, I guess that's two questions, and did he back it up by being raised from the dead? Because if he's raised from the dead, he was dead. And that's the gospel. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But I couldn't be sure the resurrection happened. So I read that sentence. If the resurrection is true, it bears the weight of Christianity. Today, I'm totally sold out on that. But here's the problem. I didn't know the resurrection was true. I read the sentence, but I could think of every doubt in the world why the resurrection wasn't true. But when I was 15, after reading that sentence, I wanted to start remembering all the things I'd started, I found out about the resurrection, where I read every night after hockey and football. <laughs> I developed this bad habit of going to bed at one o'clock in the morning and having to get up at six, which I still do. I go to bed at two o'clock every morning and try to get up at seven or eight. Um, but I was studying the resurrection. And at 15, I wrote an essay for myself, just for me, to keep track of the facts. And it was 25 pages long when I was 15. Later, I turned it in because I was, didn't do my schoolwork in college either, because it didn't answer my doubts. So I turned that in for a paper, and I got an A on it. Well, that's when I was 22, but I wrote it when I was 15. So that, I'm just saying, when you say oh, 14, 15, you couldn't have gotten into it very far. I was into it very far. But I didn't know there was evidence for the resurrection. What really bothered me was when I graduated from high school in the area here, and I started going to Macomb Community College, and later to, I transferred to Tyndale. But when I went to Macomb Community College, I went to the bookstore and looked around. And this may, name might not mean anything to 98% of you, but I found two books in the bookstore that were required in somebody's class by a German New Testament scholar named Rudolf Boltmann. Except for another German scholar, Karl Barth, Rudolf Boltmann was the most influential, well, probably the most influential New Testament theologian. Barth was a the theologian. Boltmann was the, the second most influential theologian of the late 20, second half of the 20th century. But he was very critical. He didn't think you could establish almost anything by our standards in the New Testament. And I thought, 
I've heard of this guy in my readings. I don't know him. Haven't pegged him on the chart yet. I bought the two books. One was called Form Criticism of the New Testament. The other one was called Demythologization of the New Testament, taking the myth out. You know what the myth was? Everything supernatural. Now, he didn't throw it out. He reinterpreted it in terms of what does that mean for your life. The risen Jesus means we can live alive today, even though he's, as one of his students said, even though he's moldering in a Palestinian tomb. Jesus never rose, but you can be risen today. That was his preaching. He was a Lutheran pastor besides being a German theologian. And his book scared me to death. Because I thought I was starting to get a handle on resurrection. And I still have the two copies that I bought in college. And you should see what I wrote on the margin. I didn't know a lot in those days, but I knew this much. And the, the books were about this size. And I wrote in the margins, see, because he's what philosophers would call a fideist. Rudolf Bultmann doesn't believe there should be any evidences for Christianity. Whatever's true, and it wasn't much for him, whatever's true is true because you say so, because people say so. You don't look for evidences. Evidences are wrong. Evidences are of the devil. Ev evidences are anathema, literally. So he didn't give evidences for his view why the Bible isn't the Word of God. He just said the Bible isn't the Word of God. And when I read it, when he gave these reasons, and he was only stating it because he doesn't make arguments, at 17, I'm reading this stuff, and I'm writing in the margins, no proof. Who says this? You alone? I'm writing this in the margins. Like, you're a loser. You don't have any reasons for your doubt. Yeah, you had a lot of doubt, and you're killing me because you're causing me to doubt. But the thing is, you've got no reasons against the New Testament. You're saying it's not true. So I still have this book, and up and down the page, no proof, no proof, no proof. You're a loser. No proof. <laughs> and that's what I wrote in these books. But all the time this was going on, I was studying the resurrection. And I would go to class, and instead of listening to my professors at, T at Tyndale, I opened up the book and saw where I was in my doubts and kept reading. They'd, pop, they'd say, put your book away, I'm lecturing. A minute later, I had my book back up, reading it. I, I did fine in college, but I didn't always do my, my work because I had doubts to handle. In fact, you wonder what became of that 25-page essay when I was 15? I had to turn in a paper for one of my classes at Tyndale. By the way, do you remember, either one of you guys remember uh, Bill Knapp? He just died last, he just died in January. He was 90 years old. He, he and I had been corresponding for years. One of my best professors at college, very sharp guy, just passed away. A beloved pastor, like me, Two parts of his life besides teaching sports and his theology. Good guy. And uh, I would meet with him. So he, had, he required me to hand a paper in. I didn't have time to do the paper. I was studying my doubts. I didn't have time to do my homework. I, I had to do my doubts. And so I took that 25-page paper that I wrote when I was 15. I added some pages to it. Now it was 49 pages, and I turned it into him for a paper for his class that only had to be 15 pages long. But I was doing it for me anyway, because it's resurrection stuff. So I gave him a 49-page paper on the resurrection. He didn't read it. He just gave me a day because it was too long. And, <laughs> and had it in. But that's me. The 15 became 49. So I'm, by the time I'm 22 years old, I'm making progress. Because my knowledge base was, was double what it was when I was 15. So I went up for my master's degree. University of Detroit, Philosophical Theology. And uh, David's here today, an old buddy. He's got a master's from Detroit in philosophy. Mine was Philosophical Theology. We've talked many times about the similarities between our two programs at U of D. But the whole time, when I handed papers in, I was handing papers in, my professor didn't know this, at, at Detroit, because I was still doing my, how do I know Christianity is true? And I was handing papers in that were arguments for the New Testament, that were arguments for some doctrine, that were arguments for... I did one for a Book of Mark class for a New Testament scholar, a Jesuit scholar, and I did an apologetic for the kingdom of God being true and the plan of salvation being true. He didn't know that's what I was doing it for, but I did it first class. Everything was... I'm just trying to make the point that everything was about my doubts. And then I went to Michigan State. I did a PhD in two years, which was the minimum you could do it. 
I was pastoring at the time in Kalamazoo. So I was a full-time pastor, and I drove up to Michigan State. I was working 80 hours a week for two years, which hasn't changed. I average 70, 80 hours a week right now because I'm working on that big thing Randy told you about. So I'm go doing my PhD at Michigan State, and I'm doing all my papers for my PhD on resurrection things because that's where my doubt was. My whole life was revolving around resurrection because I believe that sentence that I wrote, read way back when, if Christ had been raised from the dead, Christianity is true. So he better be raised from the dead because it's necessary, but it also stops everything else. I got my PhD, I was, just, I was only 25 years old. Uh, that was, I took a year off too, I could have told people. In those days I was into this kind of stuff. Golly, if I hadn't taken that year off, I would have been 24 with a PhD. That's pretty cool. And you know, you care about those things when you're younger. I finished when I was 25, and I'm teaching now in a Christian college. I didn't tell anybody about my doubts. I never let it out in class. Nobody ever knew I was doubting. We moved to Montana, and I was teaching at a Bible college with my newly minted PhD. I got it that June, and we were in Montana by August. I taught there for three years. And all I did there was play football. We didn't have hockey. Played football and basketball and came home and were in my doubts. Nobody knew I was doubting. My classmates did not know. But something happened while I was at Montana, and I've never been this specific in when it happened. But while I was teaching and nobody knew I was doubting, and I would teach class and be faithful to scripture and everything, because I didn't want my students to start doubting. And I would go back to my study at night, which was in my house, and I would go back to the resurrection. You say, well, didn't you do your dissertation on the resurrection? Yeah. You're still not sure? Nope. Seriously? My dissertation was 350 pages long on the resurrection? I still wasn't sure. And while I was at Montana, I didn't know that was happening, but I started reading some other material, and I came this close to becoming a Buddhist while I was a professor in a Bible college. I didn't know I was going that far. And I don't mean the kind of Buddhism with a fat man sitting down with his hands closed, and I didn't mean that. I meant this new wave of Buddhism that was going around at that time where the saying was that Buddhism was the, if this means anything to you, that Buddhism is the metaphysics for contemporary scientific physics. It was the grounding, it was the religious grounding for physics. It was a very heady kind of Buddhism without the silly stuff that can't be backed up. I mean, do you know, for example, that the, we don't know what Buddha taught? We really don't. The Buddhist scholars tell you this. The earliest sources for Buddha, as one Buddhist scholar says, PhD, Buddhist, the earliest sources for Buddha come 600 to 800 years after Buddha died. What kind of a source is that? In history, nothing is worthwhile that's 600 to... Dave's PhD is in history. Can you do history 600 to 800 years after the fact with a source? I mean, is that kind of a source? It's lousy. You cannot write a book. You know, we don't even have that many years after the American Revolution. So what would our history look like? So I, I, I realized one night walking around my home in Montana that I was very close to becoming this kind of Buddhist. And I even wondered if I crossed the line. And I will always remember the night my wife was sleeping. Our only child at that time was sleeping. And I got down on my knees in my living room and I repented of my stupidity for being that close to Buddhism. And I'm not bringing eternal security and that kind of thing in here, but you know, the Lord, I still think in some way the Lord was not letting me go because I was convicted when I realized how far I had gone. And I got down on my knees and I repented of my stupidity. Y you know what? I've almost never told this anywhere. My mom, who passed away a year ago, saintly woman, she called me on the phone with my doubts, and she said, I said, Mom, I'm afraid I'm becoming a Buddhist. And she said, 
let me ask you a question. You know how you talk about your mom, right? It's like your mom's a high school grad and she took a few classes at Eastern Michigan University. My mom's not a scholar. You know how you do these kind of things? I'm a scholar, she's not. Mom, you're not gonna be able to teach me anything. She goes, good, 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 good. Let me just ask you a question. Mom, it's not gonna be a good one. Just let me ask you a question. I'm thinking, oh my, this is just taking my time. I gotta get back to studying the resurrection. She said, would you trade Jesus for Buddha? And I said, Mom, I didn't say I was a Buddhist. I said, I think I'm coming close. I'm not taking that for an answer. Answer me, would you trade Jesus for Buddha? You know what I said on the phone? I'm not trading Jesus for a fat man. <laughs> she goes, okay, good. Follow-up question. I'm thinking, this is starting to hurt. In my... No, I wouldn't trade Jesus for Buddha. And she said, why not? For the first time in my life, you know what I said on the phone to her? I said, I don't know, Mom. I think I'm in love with Jesus. She said, exactly, and that's why I'm not worried about your doubts. <laughs> Golly, was she wise? Would you trade him for Buddha? She trumped me that day. Listen, I've debated a lot of people. My mom got the best of me that day. I don't say that to people. My mom got the best of me on the phone, high school education and three classes at Eastern Michigan University and all. She came from a good Christian home too, my grandparents, and with whom I lived for three years in Detroit, in the city. Would you trade them? No, why not? I think I love Jesus. Wow, mom, thanks. She said, yeah, well, dump that Buddha stuff and get back to work. It was a fantastic phone call, but I'd already been on my knees repenting how far I had gone. And, and I'd say to people, I almost became a Buddhist. They probably think, oh, when you were 16 or something. Folks, I had my PhD for 13 years, and I came that close to Buddhism. I knew better in my head, in my heart. It's a funny thing what you can believe when your heart goes haywire. That's how people have affairs. That's all kinds of things. You can believe other things. Okay. Now, that was the beginning of the end of my doubt. In, I was at Montana from, from uh, 1976 uh, uh, to 1979. And I came to Tyndale with Randy in 1979. They offered me to come back to my alma mater and I welcomed the chance and they didn't want me to leave Montana. I loved it there. Loved the guys. I played football. I ref football for three years. Played basketball. We won the championship. It was cool stuff. And then I go back to my room and study the resurrection night. That's my life. Sports. Oh, back when I was a teen, there was a lot of dating too, but that's another story. <laughs> so football, basketball, back to my room in Montana. But the wife I married, the love of my life, also named Debbie, and you, knew, you, knew, you guys knew Debbie, right, both of you? So my doubts are getting to be over by about 1990 or so. But in the early 90s, Debbie got sick. And to make a long story short, in 1995, she died of stomach cancer. A real long story short. We had moved from Tyndale after two years down to Liberty, and she was up at University of Virginia. University of Virginia in our area was University of Michigan in your area. It's a medical school you go to when everything else fails. And she was at UVA, and they thought they, she had something else mildly wrong with her. And when they went in and operated, the doctor came in her room, she was still in recovery, and he came in the room and he said, her two sisters came down from Detroit, and the two sisters and I were together in the room, and he said, I've got good news for you and I've got bad news for you. The good news is she doesn't have what you, we thought she had, which was not, you know, non-existent. He said, the bad news is she's got stomach cancer. 
And at that time, because I couldn't replace your stomach, stomach cancer is worse than liver cancer. And my oncologist came in a few minutes later and said, I'm sorry, but your wife has arguably the worst kind of cancer anybody can have. It's stomach pancreatic, same kind of cancer. And my world fell apart. I mean, in my mind. You know, when she did come to in the room, do you know what was on the TV when that happened, surrealistically? The Oklahoma City bombing happened the same weekend as she got operated on. And we watched all the results of Oklahoma City, and here's my wife with her own Oklahoma City bombing being told she's terminal. When they opened her up, she was stage four. And they said with stomach cancer, she wouldn't let, she would let me talk to her about anything, but she couldn't tell her. She said, I just don't want to know how long I have. They said she's got a very short time. This was the end of March. She died in August of that year, 1995. And while she was doubting, I thought to myself, this is great. My doubts, which I had ended about five years earlier, they're probably going to come back again. I mean, you know, when you're closest person to you in the world dies, I'm probably going to go back to these stupid things. I've had them for 20 years. I'm sick of them. Well, by God's grace, I never doubted again. I really haven't played around with doubt since 1990. I've had none. Nothing to speak of. I don't mean I never have something I have to look up. But I mean, no doubt at that time. But while my wife was dying, we got home in May, she lived till August. The kids had gone to school. She slept most of the day because I gave her a drug to make her sleep. And I sat out in the front porch, it was warm in Virginia, and I had a child monitor next to me. And every time she moved, breathed, I went running upstairs to make sure she was okay and all she did was turn over or cough in her sleep. But I sat on the porch and I had a make-believe conversation with God. It's make-believe, but I published it many times, stories out there. But I had a make-believe conversation with God. It, part of it was a prayer with him, but part of it was make-believe. And I, the make-believe part was picturing I was having a conversation with God. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I've tried to follow you all these years. I've been a college professor now for over 15 years. And I've really tried to follow you. And, and Dub's upstairs dying of stomach cancer? What gives? Lord, you want me to teach and you want me to write books, but all of a sudden, guess what? I'm responsible for breakfast, lunch, dinner for four kids, doing the wash, helping them with their homework. You're taking my ministry away from me because I won't have a wife. What's going on here? And I pictured the Lord saying to me, Gary, let me ask you a question. What kind of a world is this? world you play hockey and basketball, and I didn't say that. I said, a world where your son died on the cross and was raised from the dead, because that's the center of everything. And he said, make believe, the Lord said, good start. But I'm not going to explain to you, God said, I'm not going to explain to you the problem of evil. That's a little too heavy for you. After all, you only have a PhD in philosophy. I'm going to let that one go. But if the resurrection is the center of the universe, you only need to know one thing. It's going to be very hard for me to say this. But I pictured him saying to me, one day, one day after your wife died, I said, what? She's going to die? Well, I was already told she was going to die, but I kept wishing there was going to be an answer. One day, you're going to be walking down the streets of heaven with her hand in hand because you both believe in the resurrection of Jesus. If all you know is that it's a world where Jesus died and rose and claimed to be the Son of God, and I wouldn't have raised a heretic from the dead, you know enough. We don't have to solve your doubts. You don't have to refute Rudolf Boltmann right now. Do that some other time, since then I've written books on it. Uh, do that some other time. Just right now, don't worry about why she's upstairs dying. Is Christianity true? At least the deity, death, resurrection? Yes, Lord, that's the gospel, it's true. 
And is there a heaven? Yes, Lord. And is she going to be going there soon? Well, Lord, I didn't know this, but thanks. And one day you'll be with her? That's my hope, Lord. Then go in peace, my son, and stop your silly worrying. And that was my, dis- my discussion with the Lord that day. And my doubts were over about 1995 five years before she died. Now, I'm remarried. I married a 15-year family friend who also went to Thomas Road Baptist Church with, uh, with my family and I. We've been married for 28 years this summer. Debbie and I were married for 23 years, so I'll be passing the 50-year mark this summer combined. Two great women, two great marriages by God's grace, not by me. But for me, from start to finish, what tied my life together was the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection being true. And Randy held that big book up. Um, Half of my 50 books are on the resurrection. There's a lot of data out there, but we're not talking about, I mean, there's, there's data out there for you. There's enough to solve anybody's questions. But doubts are not usually factual. I wish somebody told me this in the 80s. They're usually emotional, and I did not know how to handle my emotions, so I had to go back and study psychology. This is horrible. I don't like psychology. If that's your field, I'm sorry. (laughs) But I took a diploma, a post-PhD diploma in rational motor behavior therapy. So I tell people how to handle their emotions. I taught in a PhD psych program for 10 years. Okay, only to get through my own doubts to handle my emotions. There's answers to this. Folks, my time's up. I'm just saying, the resurrection was the, was the answer to questions back in the first century. It's the answer today. Got me through my doubts, got me through my wife's death, gets me today. Lord's still with us. And these words, death, where's your sting? It's all true because of the resurrection. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for yourself. Thank you that you are the Son of God that you died on the cross for our sins, that you were raised from the dead, and you were even good enough to give us evidence when you didn't have to. Lord, thank you. Help us to be committed to you way beyond the fact of the resurrection. Help us to be committed to others who are hurting. Help us to be committed to our children and our family, friends. Let us follow you all the days of our lives. In the name of our Lord, amen.